Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast. Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 147. And this week, it's Terry's turn to be in the hot seat. Terry, what have you got for us today? Well, Daisy, I... I've been very busy lately and it's just kind of surprising to me. It's, I don't feel like I'm doing anything out of the ordinary, but I just feel like it comes time for me to share an episode and I don't have anything and that keeps happening. Yeah, scramble. But, yes. <laughs> so, you know, the easiest thing to do is to find a Jim Quick episode because they're shorter and usually very interesting. So I did. Excellent. We're going to have a pattern here that it's going to be every other week, a Jim Quick episode when Terry presents. But when I first read this one, the title of it, and read the description, I thought, oh, this guy's pretty good. I remember him from, do you remember when you and I had been part of Mind Valley? Mm. Um, when I had that membership and we did some of the trainings and things? Yeah. This guy does some trainings for them, and his main topic is flow. And even though I'm a very woo woo, out there kind of person, I've never really gotten into this idea of flow. Mm. So when I first looked at this episode, I thought, well, it's about flow or flow is in there. But oh, well, let's just see. And well, that'd then, be interesting because it's, yeah, it's one of those buzzwords. Yeah. And then I got really excited by the end and, and I'll share some reasons why. But mm. um, so it's episode of Quick Brain with Jim Quick and it's episode 322 called Growing Old, Staying Rad. Unlocking Your Full Potential with Stephen Kotler. Hmm. Stephen Kotler is the executive director of the Flow Research Collective, and he's an award-winning journalist and best-selling author of dozens of books. So, so he's the flow guy. Is he yes. the one who sort of came up with the concept? Um, he didn't come up with the concept, but he's the one that promotes it a lot and, and writes right. about it a lot. And he has a new book out called NAR County, G-N-A-R County, Growing Old, Staying Rad. And I first looked at that and I thought, well, that's a book I'm never going to read. But after... <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, hmm, sounds very... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but after listening to that, this episode, I may change my mind. And it's funny because earlier I had listened to a different episode that I thought I would share, which also was about aging. And that was with Dr. Mark Hyman and Jim Quick. Ah. And so just having two episodes back to back thinking about aging, I'm like, okay, Maybe the universe is trying to tell me something. That's also the beauty of Jim Quick episodes, because you would have something like a wrong and chatty episode mm -hmm. that's like, I don't know how long his episodes are now, but that sometimes they just mm -hmm. get ridiculous, like two and a half hours. You think, no, I'm not going to listen to that. If it's not a subject, unless it's a subject that's really appealing, mm -hmm. you're not going to commit to it. But the good thing about Jim Quick episodes is that even if you're only sort of half interested in the title, well, I'll give it a go because it's only, you know, 15 minutes. That's right. And then you might get surprised. And I was. <laughs> so this whole topic is really about aging. And we all know, and there's lots of buzzwords now about aging and longevity and how to live longer and things. Um, but in general, you know that our bodies biologically age, but people are talking about that we don't have to grow old, so to speak. And so they were talking at first in the beginning of this episode, was just the old idea of aging and how we used to think about aging and what we were taught about aging. And basically he described it as we were kind of given the slow rot theory that basically <laughs> your body is just slowly rotting away and your cognitive abilities are rotting and your physical abilities are rotting. And in the past 20 years, we've been learning a lot more about the aging process and learning. That's not really how it works. So what they're really encouraging is that if you want to sustain a higher level of performance and a higher level of you know enjoying and engaging in life, the biggest thing for you is that you have to be engaging these things or they do kind of rot. Mm. It's a matter of if you don't Makes use sense. it, you lose it. Mm physical abilities. You know, you've done some about, I think you talked before about getting up off the floor. Yeah. That used to be so easy. And now I try and do it. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm losing that ability because I don't use it very often. Yeah. And apparently grip strength and balance are two mm -hmm. really good predictors of longevity. Mm -hmm. 
So Stephen Kotler decided, based on all of his research and all of his beliefs about all this, he was going to do some experimenting just in his own life and see, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Can he learn something that's complicated? And now I did not look this up yet. I'm going to have to after this now. But at 53, he decided that he should take on a challenging thing and see what learning and what it will do for him. And so he took on this thing called park ski. Hmm. And the best the way I could understand it is it's like doing tricks while skiing. You know, maybe you run your skis on a, I picture skateboarders doing this, you know, you're on a a handrail and you're riding your skateboard and stuff, but doing all these tricks that are pretty complicated. He thought, you know, if I take all of these things I know about how to learn new things and kind of create a protocol and, and try to learn these new tricks, how will it go? And he thought, you know, maybe it'll take me five years to learn these. And what he found by really doing this concentrated kind of protocol approach, he learned how to do them all within one season. Wow. Without breaking anything? <laughs> Without breaking anything, yeah. Impressive. And then he and some other folks started to do some research and brought other people in to start learning this. So they, for example, they they got 17 older adults. Now, kind of concerned me that they said <laughs> between 30 and 68. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, You're a bit higher there, please, yeah. calling people older. <laughs> but the old theory of, you know, by 30, you're already declining mm-hmm. and you're already losing these abilities. But many of these people were in their 60s. And What happened during this time is they did all advance significantly. They might not all have been able to do all of the tricks or whatever, but they did advance their skiing significantly. And what it really helped to reinforce is that we are much more able to learn new skills and new things than what we've been taught. We've been taught, you know, if you didn't learn it by the time you were seven, you're not going to learn it. So um, I thought this was an interesting just shift for me Mm. just to start thinking about this. So in general, what um, there was a man that he referred to as Gene. I couldn't tell. I listened to it probably 18 times trying to differentiate this guy's last name or decipher it, but Colin maybe or Gollin. But he was a big researcher in aging and had advanced the studies in aging significantly. And what they found is that basically as we enter into our 50s, you're there now, right, Daisy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. As we Feeling enter into our every 50s. every year recently <laughs> as well. <laughs> as we enter into our 50s, there are some fundamental shifts in the brain happening that aren't negative shifts. Mm. Different genes get turned on. The two halves of our brain start to talk to each other differently than they've been able to before. And We start to use some of what he called, you know, the real estate, some of our brain space, we start to use some that we'd not been using before. Hmm. So again, most of us thought, yeah, I'm losing, I'm just losing brain cells all the time, but actually there are some positive changes happening. These things actually turn on new levels of intelligence, abstract reasoning, problem solving, and creativity, empathy, and wisdom. And wisdom, I thought was pretty interesting when he went into a little bit of a tangent about this, because wisdom just seems like, wow, that's a really wise person. Mm. Like it's just a, an adjective. But he said, we really can, we can show you where the wisdom lies. We can show you how much um, wisdom someone has. They can show you this scientifically. But wisdom helps make the brain impervious to cognitive decline. Interesting. So I decided I want to become a very wise person. I want to carry a lot of wisdom. It is something, that is something, a positive thing that tends to be associated with getting older. Mm -hmm. You tend to, there is that bias to thinking you're more likely to have wisdom if you're older than you're younger. You you almost have to get to Mm -hmm. a certain age before you can be classified as having wisdom. Sure, because... Wisdom comes with an accumulation of experiences. So then he talked a little bit about flow. And and one of the things I liked about this podcast episode is it wasn't really into the nitty gritty about flow. As I said, that's not ever been a topic that I've been that interested in. So in a state of flow, your norepinephrine and dopamine basically amplify pattern recognition and things. So important brain things are happening in this state of flow. And people often think of flow just meaning like, chill. Mm. 
So they they did describe a little bit that flow really means an optimal place of consciousness. It's where we feel our best and perform our best. All of the other things just kind of fade out and we can really zone into that. I was going to say, that was the word I was thinking of. You're sort of in the zone. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, while you're doing your DIY projects, you might be in flow. Mm. It doesn't have to just be in meditation or in this. It, It can be in a task. And really, it's about kind of our rapt attention. Like we have all attention kind of going to this one area. And our skills and abilities are really at a peak level. So this is why they're studying it so much to really learn what effect does this have for us? And they talked about this was from a previous episode that I had not listened to, but basically there are certain things that trigger flow. And one of the things that triggers it is we are driven toward attention in the moment. Flow follows focus. So the more we can focus on something, the more we can achieve a state of flow. And he talked about this thing called the challenge skills balance, meaning that when skills that we are taking on are skills that we can already do, they don't stretch us at all. They don't mm. create any challenge for us. And so we're, we're not going to learn. We're not going to grow. But when skills stretch us a bit beyond our current ability, but we're not overwhelmed, they're not so challenging yeah. that there's just no way we can do it. This helps us to push our skills forward and develop. And this is what flow is about, being in that heightened state of performance. But the novelty of things and the challenge is important. So flow is how we grow. So it has that real sort of forward motion feel to it. Mm-hmm. And the researcher that he talked about really highlighted this, that it is what's responsible for our growth. If, if we didn't ever get into a state of flow. Like if you can picture a a nine-year-old who has a math paper that they're really excited about and they are trying to figure out those problems, they get into a state of flow. Mm. That's how they grow. That's how they learn. And it also allows us to see things from others, other people's perspective. So it adds to our social connections, which becomes really important in this. So one of the things he talked about, again, this is the flow heavy part of this that isn't my main interest, but flow proneness, like how prone are we to want to be in a state of flow? And what they have found in research is that our desire to drop into flow is consistent over the lifespan. We don't lose that. You know, we're not, I'm 33, never mind. I don't need to do that anymore. (laughs) It actually keeps up all the way through the lifespan until the physical capabilities really prevent it from doing so. So then he started talking about this concept of peak performance aging. And when I think of this, I don't think of meaning we all have to be top notch in our field or we all have to be, you know, Lewis Howes and be entrepreneurs who are doing these amazing things, but just doing well in our aging process, still being able to perform and um, have knowledge and wisdom and things. So what really is responsible for what causes peak performance aging? And his answer is that it's engaging in challenging, creative, and social activities that require, and I I wrote these words down exactly as he said them to go back to, but that require a dynamic, deliberate, play-based approach to learning and that take place in nature. Mm, Interesting. So if any of us want to have this peak performance aging we're going to want to learn what that means and we're going to want to engage these things. So notice one of the pieces in there was social activities. And you and I have talked about this a number of times over the last few months about connection and loneliness and the power of social connection. So this is another way of looking at this. So he said that even more important than some of our other um, health benefits or health strategies, more important as we age is to maintain social connections that they found in this research that maintaining the social connections was even more important than losing weight if you're obese or quitting smoking. So it kind of ties back in with some of the things you and I've Mm. talked about. But the dynamic, deliberate, play-based is what's really involved in creating these five features physically that are so vital in this process. And those are strength, stamina, agility, 
balance, flexibility, and that we do these things on a regular basis. So what would be some ways to do that? Go back to his experiment, skiing. Now, this is where the even more personal part of this episode came up for me, because as you know, Daisy, I'm working on learning how to ski. Mm. Last winter, I thought, I'm going to learn how to snowboard. (laughs) Scrapped that after one season. (laughs) And now I'm working on skiing. So this was really exciting to me. I'm like, okay, so not only am I doing the skiing thing for some other reasons, but wait a minute, this might help my aging process, even Mm. more so than some other things I've been focusing on. So I thought this was very interesting. The strongest correlate to peak performance aging is strong legs. Ah. So leg strength correlates to preservation of physical health and cognitive function. I know we can never say when it correlates that it causes it, but losing leg strength, not having leg strength, worse physical health and cognitive function, strong legs, better physical health and cognitive function. And tips for skiing then. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't just mean physical activity because certain physical activities that we've all been taught to do or told are really good for us, they don't do any loading weight-bearing loading for our bone density. So things like running, unfortunately, we've all been taught like, oh, peak performance, peak, you know, ideal health will mean lots of running. Running actually breaks down bone density. Oh, really? Hmm. And I can't have leg strength if I don't have bone density, right? So think about some of the activities we're taught to do, especially as we get older, And one of the things we're told is this is so much more gentle on your joints, Mm. but we need it to load some weight. So skiing, he found this out after he already did his own experiment, but he found out that skiing might actually be one of two best sports for this. And the other would be hiking with a weight vest, because again, you're going to be going from side to side, you're shifting your weight, it involves balance and those other skills that I mentioned. So I thought, okay, I'm listening. (laughs) I'm going to go skiing at the end of this month. I'm listening. Uh, Another piece of interesting information about this is he said there's a lot of overwhelming data for all of that physical um, information, but also that flow, um, you know, people like, oh, it makes me feel at peace. It calms me. It makes me feel like I have a higher purpose, whatever. So I would describe those as more of what some of us might say. Yeah, yeah, those are nice things, but who cares? But flow tends to create a sense of mastery and feeling of control. And control and mastery are two of the best feelings that we can experience. And when we experience them, we get neurological benefits from them. This is what makes them the best. They're not just the most enjoyable or something, Mm. but they, they cause neurological benefits. For example, they boost our T cell production, so helps us fight disease, and help us build natural killer cells that fight off tumors and things. When you're in the flow state, there's a global release of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide pushes out stress hormones, pushes them out of your system. And he tied this back to the idea that all nine of the major causes of aging are all linked to stress and inflammation. So pushing stress out of the body is super important in not leading to that unhealthy aging. Get the stress out, which Mm. keeps the inflammation down. So yes, flow might sound woo-woo, but there's actual science, and they've been studying this for a long time, that shows it actually boosts longevity. So to wrap up the episode, this is the only one thing I I would say is my one complaint about Jim Quick episodes is he gets such fascinating guests and they are so brief that it's like, oh my gosh, we're just really getting into this. Like, okay, well, we've got to go. Yeah, they are real. They are teasers, aren't they? They often really sort of get you started and then like, oh, we're finished now. (laughs) But note to self, if you ever write a book, you want to get on Jim Quick's podcast because it will lead people to want to get your book. Mm. So he said, all right, Stephen, What should our listeners do after listening to this? What's the one thing you would say 
after today they should do. It was not skiing. He did not say <laughs> that. But he said, the first step is to change your mindset toward aging. And some people might think, that just sounds so unimportant. But he said, just changing your outlook, looking at it as, what do I do next in my life? There are still possibilities out there. I can learn and grow. I can learn new tricks. I can learn new skills. Just changing that, the research shows, can add seven and a half years to your life. Wow. You don't even have to go skiing. You just need to change your outlook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so again, you get to the end of it and you're like, oh my gosh, I have so many questions or so many gaps that I want to fill in here. But that's but a good thing. Me, yeah. But for me, it was really exciting just to think about, I am at this stage of my life working on bringing in this new skill set that is, you know, going to help with these physical things and, you know, the mastery and control. Hopefully I can do it well enough to be in a state of flow. We'll see. My partner is going to be very excited when she mm. finds out that there's research to show that skiing is probably the number one thing for us. New and motivation to that. Yes. To ski. So it's not just her dragging me along. I'm actually willingly doing this for my own benefit. But um, also this left me with this thought about and you know, I already believe this about most things, but changing our mindset, looking at it in a more positive way, not Pollyanna, mm. you know, not Cinderella, but looking at the possibilities. And even before we started recording, you helped catch me in a way that I was looking at something with kind of a negative, closed way of thinking about it. And you said, no, wait a minute, what about this? And kind of opened it back up. So changing the mindset, skiing, but really working on finding ways to be in this state of flow, I think we all could benefit from. It was interesting when you started and you were talking about, you know, challenging yourself with learning new skills. And I was thinking about all the different ways that, that could go. Did Were they just focusing in this episode and you were saying about the experiments that, that he did on himself, but that was quite specifically learning a challenging new physical skill is the mm -hmm. physical part of it sounds like it's an important part of it because I was sort of starting to think of other things um, or, you know, do they like a lot of these things? So they're like different categories and they all have their benefits or is the physical aspect key? They didn't talk about that directly. That's a great example of, wait a minute, let's do another 45 minutes here. So, you, you know, you can share more details about that. But if you think about it, some of what he talked about was just the act of, you know, creating mastery, stretching beyond what you already know. So that could be a, a talent, a creative piece. Creativity was something he mentioned several times learning a new, like when you're doing your DIY project, learning a new skill, like, mm. okay, I've never sanded a ceiling before. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. So I think those are examples of positive things, but I think the piece that he said about the, the most important is when they are, you know, novel things that involve these criteria and one of them being in nature. Mm. And social, that was the other big piece in that mm. description that he talked about. So he didn't say, you know, the only way this is going to be helpful is if they're physical activities. But I think so much of his own experience with this and then some of the research they've done was specifically on the physical activities. But I, I don't know, um, there wasn't more about, you know, the psychological things. Like, what about if at age 54, I want to learn Spanish? Yeah. Is that going to help me benefit from some of these things? Certainly a sense of mastery, a sense of, you know, um, control, those kind of things can happen, but it's not going to load any uh, weight bearing benefits on my legs or anything, but unless I carry really heavy Spanish books. Um, <laughs> Strapped to your legs. <laughs> that's right. That's how I'm going to do it. No, it's interesting because I was thinking at the start and then you sort of went down the the physical track, but it brought to mind a talk I went to last week from there's a fabulous local garden, which I don't know how many of the listeners know, but, but you certainly do. I trained as a garden designer many decades ago. Didn't have much opportunity to practice it in France, but it, it started 
to become something that I've started uh, getting back into a bit. And there's the most fabulous and very famous garden that I've never been to before. And it's it's opening back up. It closes for the winter. It's opening back up again soon. And I can't wait to go. And I went to a talk an evening last week from the head gardener. And he was sort of telling the history of the place, but giving some great examples of planting schemes. And in particular, talking about succession planting. But the reason I'm using that as an example is that I think for me anyway, it jumped straight into my head, this good example of flow, this what you were talking about, about it being just stretching a talent that you already have. So I already have that talent of garden design, of planting design, of putting plants together. As I was listening to him talk, I was thinking, gosh, there's there's so much more I can learn here. This idea of succession planting, which, you know, which I know about, but he's, you know, he's mastered it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this garden that's just half an hour away. So we've got the we've got the nature ticked there. We got the social aspect because I'll often probably be going with a friend. But even if you're going on your own, you're going to bump into people. You're going to mm-hmm. chat to people while you're there. Um, but it was exciting identifying this not necessarily gap in my knowledge, but certainly an area where I can really challenge myself, where I can really stretch. And as you were saying, it's that balance between a stretch, but not too much of a stretch. It doesn't feel like, oh, goodness me, I'm going to have to learn everything from scratch. There's so much to learn. No, I'm building on skills I already have. Mm -hmm. But all this is exciting because it's something new to learn. So I'm really looking forward to visiting this garden regularly and seeing for myself how this succession planting that they do so well plays out because I will be able to go monthly or even more and look at the same border and actually see it happening over the Mm -hmm. season and get inspiration from that and build my own knowledge and hopefully then, you know, translate that back into um, the skills that I have that I can share in my work and all the rest of it. So, yeah, really excited about that. It seems really fitting. Absolutely. And the thing that excites me as I listen to you is, again, going back to the mindset piece, it would be easy to say, well, you know, I've got the dogs and I'm busy and met a few friends. I'm just comfortable where I am. But instead to say, I want to learn new things. I've got this whole next phase of my life. What do I want to do? What new things do I want to learn? How can I add to some things that to me, that shows a opening a positive mindset that's going to serve you really well, even if it's not skiing. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, maybe I could get back into doing squats. <laughs> uh-huh. That would help. But no, I think, I think that mindset piece is, well, we both share the the opinion that it's important, but it feels very fitting. It's something that I've just, it, it's something that I've been a bit preoccupied with of late. I've really sort of felt the aging process, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's going through menopause, whatever it is, I've kind of just been feeling a lot of that decline and getting a bit mm-hmm. too into that mindset you know, getting, well, you know, it's just the menopause, my, you know, that's my memory is going because it's the menopause and I, you know, I've got more aches and pains and I can't do as much DIY as I used to. And that's just because I'm getting older. So I have, you know, I've been guilty of getting a bit stuck in that negative Mm -hmm. mindset around aging. So yes, especially when you said how important, what is it? What is it? It could add seven and a half years just to switch my mindset. So I think that's a really important thing for me personally, and I'm sure loads of people listening to this mm-hmm. will will fall into that same category. It's a really important thing to try and start focusing on. And I know it's not as easy as just snapping your fingers and changing the mindset. Mm-hmm. It's something you've got to work on. But certainly, I feel it's something I've got to work on because I have been preoccupied with it in a negative way of late Mm -hmm. and that's not good and I know it doesn't it doesn't feel good and it just you start sort of spiraling into thinking forwards in a negative way well it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse Mm -hmm. 
maybe it doesn't have to. Yes, of course, there are things that come with aging. There are physical things that, you know, and mental things that you can't necessarily get away from, but there are some benefits too, and let's harness those and let's try and hack, <laughs> hack mm -hmm. some of these things. It reminds me of thinking about, you know, people that we know, people that other people in our lives have talked about or now with social media, stories you've seen on, you know, social media about people who are in their 90s or 102, what helped them get there mm -hmm. with cognitive abilities still intact and with physical abilities still intact? They're actively doing things. They're learning new things. You know, they went back to school in their 70s yeah. to finish that degree that they started back in, you know, their 20s or something. They they stretch themselves. They did take on new skills and new things and they're active. Like I don't normally read any of those stories about someone who sits in their recliner 18 hours a day thriving. Now they might still be alive, but they're probably not thriving. Yeah, no, you're right. But when you really think about who's thriving, it's the people who are doing, you know, mm. part of what he described, this real active social growth centered and again, I'm not talking as much as he did about getting into flow, but all of the benefits of doing these things. Yeah. Yeah. Very inspiring. It sounds like a good episode to go and listen to and maybe track down a few more things from him. Now, in a few weeks, I might come back and say, well, now that I'm on crutches from my skiing incident, uh, no, um, no, it really makes me excited. Like it gives yeah. me newfound motivation to yeah. develop this skill. Um, so it's exciting. Yes, I think that's the thing. I think it's a really good thing to be excited about learning something new, mm -hmm. excited about identifying an area of your life that needs that growth. Because you do, you get mm -hmm. fired up about it and look forward to learning something new. We'll have to have another episode about getting through the pain <laughs> of, the, of that process because that's, that's what often happens, isn't it? You get stuck in the starting mm -hmm. to do it and the difficult parts of that. I think we've, we've touched on that in episodes before, but yeah. Yeah, and I think even going back to this episode, part of why I have struggled sometimes with learning new things is I don't like not having mastery over mm. something. Oh, yeah, I'm like that. I want mastery of it immediately. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting knowing the benefit of mastery. We want that, but we can't yeah. start there. We have to build it. Mm. We have to give our, our brain and our body, our being time to master it. So... It's a good reminder to me because I, you know, when I'm on the bunny hill with the five-year-olds, <laughs> I feel kind of ridiculous, but I can't master it yet. It will be worth it. That's right. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Very good. Well, I hope everyone finds something in this that is useful to them and might even inspire some of us to go back and, and read his book or listen to some more of his talks and things and get into this area of um, thinking about our future. Fabulous. Until then, I hope everyone has a great week. Have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.